People have been told in this area especially to be ready to evacuate at a moment's notice. Uh, but police say that not everyone is heeding those warnings. Some people have been told to evacuate and they say they are going to stay put and ride this out and simply hope for the best despite the images that we've seen of entire homes, entire cars being swallowed up by this lava flow. Lava and fumes shooting high into the air as two more fissures open up over the weekend. Officials tell residents nearby to evacuate their homes while also warning that an eruption at the top of the volcano is possible that could shoot ash and plumes 12 miles. As we know, it is on a private piece of farmland. This is the 18th fissure that has opened up and you can see just how high that lava is flowing. Uh, into the air. We're more than a mile away and we can see it really easily. So you can imagine just how big uh, this fissure is. Some of these fissures are several hundred yards long. Now there have been 37 buildings and homes destroyed by them since Kilauea started erupting more than a week ago. There have now been 2,000 people who have been displaced, evacuated from their homes. We actually. Behind me, what you see is activity going on at Kilauea summit right now. Since the lava lake receded deep into the volcano, we have had a continual uh, emission of vigorous steam from the conduit that had been evacuated of lava deeply into the volcano. In addition, we've had rock falls down into that steep conduit, which sometimes cause the, the updraft of ashy material that mixes with the steam and forms a discolored brownish, sometimes pinkish plume. This morning's plume is a little bit larger than those that we've been seeing and uh, may indicate the addition of some fresh lava streaming through the rubble pile at the bottom. That's just a preliminary interpretation, but something we're considering. So far, we have not seen any evidence of these overpressured steam-driven explosions, which is what we're worried about in the long run here at the summit of Kilauea. So just to emphasize, we have seen no evidence of that activity yet, but this is something we're watching for. Transitioning down to the lower east drift zone, I'd like to mention that overnight we had continued lava effusion from what we're calling fissure 17, which is at the northeast end of the fissure system that has been active over now for many days. That fissure is producing lava fountains that are, is, are throwing spatter up more than 100 feet in the air. In addition, the lava flow is moving away from the fissure, generally in an easterly direction, paralleling Highway 132, but south of Highway 132. The lava flow has moved uh, just about a mile from the fissure overnight. It started to turn a little bit southerly, uh, moving slowly, but we're watching it carefully. And USGS crews are in the field working closely with Hawaii County Civil Defense to make sure they are updated as, po as quickly as possible at th about the position of lava and uh, the areas that it may threaten. There are a couple of other fissures in the system that are weakly active at this time to the southwest of Fissure 17, uh, and we're also keeping track of those. That's the update from Kilauea today. Magma tends to do is it tends to deform the surface of the earth. It tends to uh, cause the surface to bulge upward or to spread apart. One of the instruments we use to measure deformation is a tilt meter. A tilt meter measures very subtle changes in the surface of the earth as magma accumulates beneath the station or moves upward, for example. Another instrument we use is the Global Positioning System, or GPS. So we put several of them out on the volcano. We record signals from satellites orbiting above the Earth, and we look for movement of one of the stations with respect to the other. As the ground deforms, the volcano changes its shape, those stations move, and that tells us something about what's going on beneath the surface. Most earthquakes associated with young volcanoes are related to the movement of magma deep beneath the volcano and may indicate that a quiet volcano is becoming active. Although large eruptions are often preceded by several significant earthquakes and many small rock-breaking quakes, there's also a continuous release of seismic energy associated with the underground movement of magma. Volcanic tremor is a seismic vibration caused by the pulsing of pressurized magma and gas and can last for minutes or days. The seismogram is of longer duration and more continuous than rock-breaking earthquakes of the same amplitude. Earthquake swarms recorded by seismometers and the ground deformation, monitored by tilt meters, help scientists determine the location and depth 
of moving magma beneath the volcano, which in turn gives scientists information to issue hazard warnings. Monitoring volcanic gases is very exciting, especially at the very precursory phase of unrest. objective in gas monitoring is to determine changes in the release of certain gases from a volcano. Such changes can be used with other monitoring information to provide eruption warnings and to improve our understanding of how volcanoes work. When the magma is very deep beneath the volcano, it has a lot of gas dissolved in it. But when that magma starts to rise towards the surface, the gases will come out of the magma. And if this happens very quickly, then the volcano might erupt explosively. At volcanoes like Mount St. Helens, it's important to monitor the gases on a routine basis because at any time, there could be another injection of gas-rich magma from below, which might cause the volcano to enter another eruptive phase. My name is Larry Mastin. I work for the U.S. Geological Survey for a volcano hazards program. My specialty is understanding and reducing impact from volcanic ash during eruptions. Volcanic ash is geographically the most widespread hazard of all volcanic hazards. We know from Eyjafjallajökull, the Icelandic volcano that erupted in 2010, as well as the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens and big eruptions like Pinatubo that you can be many thousands of kilometers away from a volcano and you can, you can still have your life disrupted by its eruption. The greatest hazard uh, from ash to airplanes is when ash is ingested into a jet engine. The ash melting temperature is usually below the normal operating temperature of the engine. So the ash melts and it coats on the turbine blades and it can cause the turbines to stop running. In the United States, we have about 170 active volcanoes mostly in Alaska and the Aleutian Islands, and although they're remote, more than about 300,000 people fly over those volcanoes or near those volcanoes every day. We have, on average, about one eruption per year from the Aleutians and from Alaska, and at least a few smaller eruptions. Our objective is not only to keep people safe by avoiding that ash, but also to minimize the amount of disruption from those eruptions. So. What we do in our group is we develop and test uh, numerical models that track volcanic ash and uh, forecast where it will go and where it will land during an eruption. Once we have a forecast from a model, we can forward them to our partners at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration where they can be fed into an aviation flight warning system that can be used to either reroute or reschedule flights to avoid that ash. I like developing models, but I especially like developing results that have some societal value. Hi, I'm Dr. Dina. I work with the U.S. Geological Survey in Menlo Park, California with the Volcano Hazards Program. Today we're going to talk about calderas. When most people think about volcanoes, they think of a triangle shape, and that's what many volcanoes look like but there are other shapes too, and one of those is called a caldera. What we've done is created a simple experiment to show how calderas form. The experiment uses flour, a piece of tubing with a balloon attached at the end, and a bicycle pump. So what I want you to imagine is that this is the surface of the earth in an area that's volcanically active. Underneath the surface of the earth, we're gonna inject some magma. When we inject the magma using our handy bicycle pump, it's going to push the surface up. So let's watch. As you can see, the flour is being moved out of the way as we inflate the balloon or add magma to the system. The Volcano Hazards Program has monitoring equipment at different volcanoes to watch ground deformation such as this. 
in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to pretend that this large amount of magma erupts. To do that, I'm going to let the air out of the balloon, and then we're going to watch to see what happens. So as the air comes out of the balloon, you want to imagine the magma escaping from the magma chamber. Once the magma leaves the magma chamber, there's nothing to hold up the overlying rock. And so all that rock collapses down to where the chamber used to be. So you can see in our experiment, the flower has now collapsed in a somewhat circular shape. We call this shape a caldera.